everyone, I'm Rachel Lowe from Physiopedia. This is week five of the Managing Children with Cerebral Palsy course. I am absolutely delighted to be chatting to Leon Taylor today. Hi, Leon. Hi there, Rachel. Are you okay? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, joining me today. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you. You have many, many strings to your bow and um, without wanting to tell a wrong story. Um, I was hoping that we could start with you introducing yourself and perhaps telling your story to uh, all the participants on this course and um, any messages kind of through your story initially that you have for them. Okay, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm Leon Taylor. Uh, I'm from Derby in the UK. Um, which is in the in the East Midlands, uh, for those of you that know the UK. Uh, I was born 41 years ago. I know I look so much younger, but, <laughs> but then <laughs> the grey gives it away, to be fair. <laughs> um, um, unfortunately, uh, when I was being born, my, uh, I, my mother had a really traumatic um, birth um, experience, uh, and there was a delay in me actually being delivered. So I was delivered eventually as a £10 baby, uh, about two hours really later than I should have been, um, and, that, and that left me with the CP. Uh, it predominantly affects the right side of my body, so I've got a, a form of the condition uh, known as hemiplegia, which is which is actually really quite common in terms of those that are affected. Um, it was it was one of those that when I, I was very very young, um, you know, I think as parents and uh, my mum and dad as, as young parents didn't really sort of know an awful lot about disabilities is you don't unless you're affected by it um, but it was it was quite clear that once I got to about 18 months old um, I, I was struggling to sort of pull myself up and to sort of walk around and that's when um, uh, appointments were made for me to see specialists to, to, to find out if there was a problem so um, that was when I first got the diagnosis of the CP um, at 18 months and it was actually that's quite, that's quite late isn't it these it days is. yeah mm. but i mean you know we are talking sort of back in the 1970s so, of course uh, yeah as my youngest child says you know that's really is the olden days daddy <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but it, 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 was, it was one of those and it was it wasn't until i was about three that i actually managed to to, to walk albeit at that stage i was i was wearing sort of um, calipers really to uh, on my right leg to sort of help support me um, and it was also decided that when I was was three that I would benefit from having um, the, the tendon in my right leg um, cut the Achilles tendon to actually sort of help to lengthen it and, and to allow me really to sort of walk in in, in, a, in, a, in a much better way um, because I was uh, it was discovered that I got a leg length difference but this actually did help to come say a little bit for it the downside of it and of course we, we're going back again nearly 40 years is that the way that they actually did the procedure meant that I now have no movement in my ankle or my foot um, and still to this day I, I, I wear a splint on, on my right leg um, but you know the, the benefits to it were that, that I did then begin to, to, to walk um, and then went on into primary school and, and I think, you know, one of the first memories of going into primary school was that, it was, that I was very much different to the other children. Um, you know, there was obviously the, the physical difference that was, was most apparent. And obviously, young children particularly are quite curious. So I do remember sort of being lots of questions when I was first starting at primary school. You know, what's that on your leg? You know, that sort of thing. Um, but I actually progressed pretty well through through primary education. Um and, you know, I've always, and, you know, my sort of mantra even to this day is about my abilities over my disabilities. Um, so I tried, you know, not to let it hold me back. I got involved in physical education uh, as usual at school. One, one of the frustrating things, I think, that was, was that in those days there was very little in, in, in the way of, of disability um, sport participation in terms of uh, the, being the access to it, I suppose, locally. And, and I found that I was always growing up and obviously you start to get the school teams and I was always interested in football, but other sports as well, trying to sort of make my way into those school teams was really difficult. Um, and, and I think that's perhaps sort of as I got to sort of the age of nine or 10, when I started to realise how much 
or, 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 the, or the impact, should I say, of, of the disability. And yes, you know, there the, the were sort of difficult times, I think, you know, then, because it was then a, a realisation that I was different. Um, I was well supported um, in terms of the hospitals. Um, I, I used to go for regular physio, although I didn't particularly enjoy it at the time. Um, you know, because, <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know it's really important. You know, for, for when you've got CP to be doing the regular stretching and sort of really trying to work. You know, the the, the affected side of your body. Um, so I was I was benefiting from that. But as I say, I think there was that realization that yes, I was different. And, and, and sort of having to accept that and, and, and deal with it. How do, you think, just, how do you think people can be supported through that these days? Um, I, 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 I think in, in, in some ways it's about sort of um, able-bodied kids, I suppose, being sort of exposed to disability much more as well. And I think, you know, one of the benefits, I mean, I, I went through mainstream education, but I know that a, a lot of children with CP don't. Um, and but but I think things have moved on certainly in the UK in, in in recent years and more children will go through mainstream it's then it's about that sort of acceptance by others as well and I think to be honest it's an earlier age at a primary level that, that children are just curious they will ask the questions um and and I suppose it's being prepared for that um and it it, it is dif it is difficult and I, what I was going to go on to say is that sort of moving then into secondary education it became a whole new ball game because, you know, for one, secondary schools are much bigger. Um, and also, you know, it, it was then that, that I said, from, started to experience the, the taunts and, and, and uh, you know, the, the sort of the bullying and and, um, and and a lot of it was verbal. Um, but, you know, that, that can really be, as, you know, as hurtful in, in some ways as, as sort of, you know, being physically sort of um, set upon, for want of a better phrase. And... Um, I, I, I do remember being sort of in my sort of early to mid teens and, and, and really thinking, you know, this is horrible, um, you know, and, and, and thinking, do I want to sort of carry on in, the, in this environment, that being mainstream school? Um, and, you know, I did stick at it. Um, again, there was still the issue around sport that whilst obviously I, I took part um, in PE sessions, you know, finding some things more tricky than others, particularly around coordination. Um, obstacle races have never been there <laughs> than the best. And it involved in balance. So I wasn't always the first person to be picked to, to, for the teams within sports day. But, but joking aside, you know, it was also an issue for me because I felt I've got a lot to offer um, in terms of sport and my, and my love of it. Um, but, but a lot of the time it was trying to set the torch on TV, not being able to break into those school teams. And, and, and that, and I think, you know, that was a real frustration um, growing up because there was always that real love of sport in my life. Uh, my mum, for example, she was sort of team captain of practically every sports team at school. She always tells the story that she, she wasn't the swimming captain, but that was only because she wasn't very good at swimming. <laughs> but, you know, forever in the sport. So it was there in the blood. And, and, and I think, you know, I did find that frustration. I think the other thing that I remember from my childhood is that I sort of hit 16 uh, and in terms of the NHS in, in, in the UK that was basically then that was the end of the regular physio um, it sort of just stopped um, and you know that was a bit and, and I think you know if you turn around to to a child at that age or a young adult and you say that's it you've, you've not got to come anymore there's that bit of a tendency to think oh well that's great and not always thinking of sort of the implications of you know why you were doing the physio um so you know after that it was just a matter of, of sort of having a, an annual mot as i used to call it with the with the, <laughs> the consultant to, to see how things were going um but sort of moving moving on i suppose from school i, I then went on to do my a levels at a local college um and, and then went on and and did a degree uh, did a degree in politics of all subjects um thoroughly enjoyed that uh, and met some great friends and again I think you know that was another phase of my life again then where there was a lot more acceptance because you know you're into early adulthood there and I think you know people have sort of got over that sort of I don't know that sort of immature phase I suppose uh, you know and, and it, it was about um, you know 
a much better engagement. You know, and I've built friends for life from from going to university, and I thought that was great. And it was at that stage that I sort of really got back into my sport a little bit. You know, um, and and I used to play some recreational five side football, and I played badminton, and I joined other clubs and things like that within the university environment. And and I did, you know, I did really feel that sort of sense of uh, of belonging, um, probably more so than than, than ever before. Um, moving on through my life, um, it was then obviously into the, the big, big wide world after 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 uni. Um, having done a politics degree, I thought it'd be good to go and work for a member of parliament for a bit, which was an interesting experience. Um, it's quite good, really. I haven't been able to directly lobby on uh, disability issues, really, by working for a member of parliament. <laughs> so I did that for about four years. Um, but in terms of the sport, it sort of tailed off a gait a, a little bit. And then I always tell a funny story that I was literally at work one um, one lunchtime and just surfing the internet. And th- by this time, I'm sort of in my late 20s. And I came across an article on the Football Association's website saying that not only were the England senior football team looking for a new goalkeeper because David Seaman was retiring, the cerebral palsy team needed a goalkeeper as well. And if you were interested to get in touch, it was one of those bizarre things. So I, I got in touch, and uh, the weekend that my sister was married, not great planning, um, I had a trial, the, did a bit of the trial, went to my sister's wedding, went back for the for the rest of the trial, and then within three months I was flying out to Buenos Aires in Argentina to make my debut for England. Um, wow. So <laughs> it's a bit of a, you know, it's a sudden jump there, you know, from sort of getting a little bit frustrated, as I say, in, in certainly my teenage years around sort of, wanting to be more and more involved in sport and not always getting those opportunities to suddenly, you know, I'd come across something again, you know, the publicity wasn't great at that time. I didn't realize that there was an England cerebral palsy football team until I happened to come across it in that way. But, you know, from there, you know, that began, began a whole new journey. Um, So I was involved with, with, with the England and the Great Britain team um, going to Beijing in 2008 for the Paralympics. What a wonderful experience that was. And to meet so many people from across the world with a whole wide range of disabilities. But, uh, you know, I think it, the, the thing that's stuck with me about the, the Paralympics is that suddenly being disabled was normal in those yeah. commas. And actually for those people that were able-bodied, they, you know, the, 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 it, it was almost like a, a sort of a reversal of, of everyday life. Yeah. Um, but, but again, just to, to, to be involved in something on that magnitude was was fantastic. You know, I had the chance to travel the world playing football. You know, schoolboys dream to go and play for your country, and I did it and, you know, managed to captain my country as well. And, you know, I've got so many fantastic memories. Um, and, you know, the, the, the positive for, for the CP, of course, is that you have a, a, have a physio attached to the England squad. So we're certainly getting all the stretching in again. Yeah. Through. Working out hard. You were but, getting, but you're it, getting the new modern techniques now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, definitely. You know, and you know, it, it was there, and you know, out, we, we we trained regularly, but outside of training, they book your appointments, and you, you know, you get everything that you needed in in that regard, which was great. Um, I think I've paid the price a little bit um, in terms of my body uh, uh, over the years by by doing so much sort of competitive sort of sport. Uh, it has taken its toll a little bit. Um, I've had to have one of my knees. Um, I've had to have some surgery on that a couple of years ago, and I feel like in the same way. Um, so, um, but 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 at the end of the day, you know, I've had some fabulous opportunities through there. And what I've tried to do is actually now try and put some back in, in, in back in again. So I'm um, I'm an ambassador for a, a UK charity, Cerebral Palsy Sport. Um, which involved me going along to different uh, events around the country and, and sort of telling my story and encouraging young people with disabilities and particularly CP, you know, how they too can get involved and, 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 and sort of realise their potential. And, you know, for me, that is so, so rewarding. And, yeah. You know, really, really enjoy doing that now. Can I ask you a couple of questions on mm-hmm. what you've already said? So you've talked about, so I just want to ask you a couple of things. You talked about, so... Th- at school, feeling different, being different, and the bullying and things like that. Um, I just want to ask you, what advice can you give to healthcare professionals about how we can support individuals with cerebral palsy through that experience? 
Mm, I think I think that's a really good question. I, th- I think a, a lot of it is around reassurance, actually. Um, I think it's about ensuring that the child as well sort of understands their condition and how it affects them so that then they feel able, you know, when questioned. And, you know, let's face it, children aren't always the most sensitive, but it's actually able then to respond to that um, and sort of explain what it's about. Because often that's what other children want. They want an explanation, you know, because they, they see something different. And for them then, you know, they need an answer to it. So if if the child with CP feels more confident in talking about how their condition affects them, then I think that will make those conversations easier. So I think that's, a, you know, that, that is really important. Okay. You know, sorry. Yeah, okay, that's good. Sorry, you carry on. No, I was, I was going to say, you know, I think there's been there's been a definite change, and I sort of hinted at this earlier in the, our conversation, that from when I was was young, I was probably a bit of an exception, really, in terms of um, having, having the cerebral palsy and actually going to mainstream school. You know, for a lot of people would have gone through special school, um, but but now a lot more children. You know, it's it, it's noted that that it can be it can it can be a good thing to go through mainstream. Um, it's it's not always easy, you know. You know, you do get those difficult questions, you get those challenging times. Um, but actually, when I think about it, reflecting now, um, it, it it helped me. Um, although I didn't always think that at the time. Yeah, for so. sure. And then and then you talked about so obviously you've done so much with your football and being goalkeeper on the cere- England's cerebral, cerebral palsy team. Um, now you got there through following your own passions. So um, how can we as healthcare professionals now? reinforce or help people to follow their passions as they move into you know move more into adulthood um or you know in children as well um any individual with cerebral palsy is there any other thing we can do to help people with that respect i mean i i I think a lot of it is is around awareness raising you know for me it's about healthcare professionals being aware you know whatever country that they're working in um, you know, and then more locally, the, the opportunities that are available um, and so that then they're able to feed that information in to the parents and to the child themselves so that they hopefully can find something that, you know, that, that suits them. I mean, I, you know, I can obviously speak a lot for the UK in terms of how things have developed, and, you know, and, and, and now certainly through charities like CP Sport and uh, there are other charities having help, what they what they try and do now is to actually put on events um, to to encourage uh, children, young people to come along to, to sort of have a, a you know a try it day um, to to see if they if they really like it. And I think that's where health you know health, health professionals have a, have a part to play because it's about them sort of being associated within the right network so that they're aware of these opportunities and, and can pass the information on because they're often, along with the schools, obviously, the, the people that have a lot of contact with these children. So it's about getting the messages out. And I think things have improved tremendously, but, but it, it, it's, it still sometimes can be the communication. People, oh, I, you know, I wasn't aware that that, that was available and, you know, and I still get it now, so... So maybe yeah. it's part of our role, our role to explore um, what passions ind- individuals have, and then to make it um, to make an effort to find out what's available to them and encourage, and, and also with our knowledge of the capabilities of that person to advise them in the right direction. I guess. No, I quite agree, and obviously we're at a time now, immediately after the the Paralympic Games, that you know disability sport gets gets right in my view so much attention over that couple of week period it's a real great opportunity to sort of harness that enthusiasm that's out there as well um you know and, and I, I as i say you know i hope that sort of mainstream sports clubs you know across the globe really sort of take on board the fact that that they could be offering um our opportunities to to those with disabilities um, because you know pe- people want it, but the the other thing that I would say is that you know not everybody's going to disability will become a Paralympian in a particular sport. Actually, you know the most important thing to begin with is actually sort of that grassroots participation, which in itself will, will increase you know a child or young person's self esteem and their self confidence. You know from there, 
you know, you know, who knows where their, their potential may take them. But you know, like I said, the, the starting point is actually having those, those, those localized opportunities. Yeah, perfect. Now, um, you mentioned also that you have taken on several ambassadorial roles, and you talked about CP Sport. But I know also that you're on the committee for World CP Day which is this week on Wednesday. Um, and you're wearing green, which is what we're all going to do on Wednesday. <laughs> um, so would you like to just tell us a little bit about World CP Day and what we can do to help? Okay. So World CP Day um, originates, it's, it's only around five years old. 2012, I think, was the first time that it was actually celebrated. Um, and, and the idea of it really is to raise the public awareness of, of what the condition is. Um, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings. And, you know, I, I give an example that, you know, uh, when my wife says that her husband's got CP, people immediately think that I'm in a wheelchair, for example. And I think you know, there are a lot of misconceptions out there. So I think the real important part of, of, of World CP Day is to raise that, that public awareness about what, what the condition is and the different ways that it can affect people. Um, I think it's an also it's an opportunity though for to, to celebrate, as I said earlier on, about people's abilities over their disabilities as well, and that is really important, you know. And just because somebody's got CP doesn't mean that they that you know they haven't got talent, um, you know, and, and, and far from it. So I think you know that that is another uh, really important sphere for me. I think the the uh, sort of linking it to, to sort of um, physios, you know, the, there's the whole issue around sort of uh, medical and therapeutic intervention. Um, you know, there are disparities um, ac across the world. You know, we, this is a global initiative. There are 50 countries that are sort of actively signed up to this. Um, but there are differences out there in terms of the treatments that are available, um, you know, both to children and to adults with CP. And I think, again, it's sort of, it's, it's trying really to sort of raise people's awareness of the good practice that's out there. And to encourage maybe some some nations um, to to do more, or to actually make them aware of the technology that's out there. And an interesting sort of little side story to that is that, that I mentioned that I wear a splint on my right leg, and so ever since I've worn one, which is obviously the whole of my life, it's always been that if I needed a new one, it was a matter of sort of casting it using sort of plaster of Paris. Now, of course, there's a scanning technique. But even here in the UK, we're only just sort of uh, undertaking that. And I've yet to have one, but I promise the next time I need one, I'll be able to be scanned, which will be revolutionary. But, you know, and that, that but it's these sort of things. It, it, it's about sort of sharing that awareness and that, that, that information. Um, and, and the idea of wearing green is that green was adopted as the colour for the day. And so, you know, by it's to spark a conversation, really. So, you know, it's not, not a colour that people always wear, to be fair. Um, and the idea being, oh, you know, you know what, what it is symbolic of, and it can start a conversation. So that, you know, for me, it's really, it really is important. And um, I, I hope that, you know, that the, the day gets the coverage that it deserves. So maybe we can ask everyone for on Wednesday for World Cerebral Palsy Day that everyone wears green and that maybe everybody can just do one thing to promote cerebral palsy, um, to share knowledge. So maybe taking something they've learned from this course to share knowledge on Cerebral Palsy Day. Just tell someone something new that you've learned um, and share some of that knowledge. And it, Yeah, definitely. And it'd be really good if we can uh, get World CP Day and wear green trending on Twitter. That'd be fantastic. Okay, so get those tweets out on... What's the hashtag for World CP Day? Is it hash World CP Day? It, it is, yeah, hashtag World CP Day. Hashtag World CPD, CP Day. Okay, now also you talked, so you're, I know you're, you've are you mentioned it already, and I know one of the things you like to talk about is focusing on ability over disability. Um, would you like to just talk a little bit about that and how we can, we again as health healthcare professionals can sort of support that and, and remind us how important that is? I think it is, and you know, I've obviously had a lot of experience of of sport, um, and, and 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 an interesting sort of side issue around sport is that a lot of the coaches that are involved in it are able-bodied, um, so don't always understand the condition fully, and don't always understand how it sort of impacts. Um, but you know, it, it's about sort of being aware that 
and it's not just about sport this but if an adjustment needs to be made it's trying to sort of recognize that which actually by making that sort of minor adjustment might mean that the person's ability to take part in an activity or to do something you know is much improved and, and makes them feel less self-conscious of their disability so hence you know you're trying to focus on, on, on their ability to do something rather than thinking about the restrictions that, that prevent them from doing something um so that, again that you know that that's that that's my sort of positive mental attitude that i sort of try and have but i'm not i'm not going to sort of sit here and say that i don't ever have sort of dark days and, and, and get frustrated and and an interesting one when we talk about sort of abilities and disabilities is, is driving a car for example because i'm affected on my right leg not only do i have to drive an automatic car because um, i don't have the power in that leg but I also have to drive with a left leg accelerator, which confuses everyone. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I use my left leg to drive. But actually, you know, I'm still able to drive. And that, you know, that I suppose that's a bit of a tangible example. That just by making that adjustment, you know, it shows that, you know, I've got that ability to drive. So it's not just saying just because I've got the CP and my leg's affected, you know, can't drive then. You know, let's just look at, at the abilities of, of, of the situation. I think that's yeah. a that's a really important message, isn't it? As we as we move on to learning about sort of activities of daily living, play, vocational training, things like that, to really focus on ability. Um, I mm. think that's the simple message: focus on ability and not disability. And, and it is really simple. If we and if we just remember that one thing, I think we will be able to make a huge difference to the individuals that we're working with. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. And I think, you know, what, what we're wanting to do, and what we're wanting to create is, is an environment where, where children, young people, adults with CP, you know, their, their, their self-confidence, their self-esteem, you know, doesn't have to be not just because of the condition that they're affected by, you know. And, and I think that's a really important message to take away that, you know, what we're wanting to do is, 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 you know, in terms of daily living, yes, let, let's aid somebody's daily living. And if they're, they're going to need adaptation to, uh, of any type, let's see what we can do to provide that in order that the, the, the ability shine through. And that, for me, is a really important message. I like that. Having, making, helping people make their abilities shine through. That's really nice. Um, um, okay, so it's been really good to chat to you. Is there any, are there any other final messages before we end here um, that you'd like to share with everybody who's going to be watching this? Well, uh, an interesting one for me is that locally I'm a patron of a, a local group for children and their parents of children that have got hemiplegia, the same uh, type of CP that I've got. And and I think, you know, one message to take away and one that I always say to the parents is, look, you know, I'm a fully grown man now. I'm married. I've got three children. Yes, I've got CP, but it hasn't stopped me sort of getting on in life. I work full time. You know, I've had, you know, I, I, I've got on and, and, and been able to, to live, you know, a really fulfilling life. And I think sometimes parents of, of, of young children really fear. For the future. And I do understand that to an extent. But actually, I think, you know, you've got to believe people like myself in the sense that I've lived through it. Um, yes, I get the aches and pains. and <laughs> But, you know, you, you get through that. And, and I think, you know, that's, you know, we're, we're resilient. You know, um, I think when you're born with a disability, I think you, you end up with some inherent sort of resilience there. Um, and, and, and for me, you know, that's, that's allowed me to be the person that I am. Leon, you are an absolute inspiration. Um, you have achieved so much in your life and it's so good to talk to you about them. Um, and it's also really good to hear those messages and those and those bits of advice that you are able to give to us to help us um, work with other individuals with cerebral palsy. So thank you so much for chatting to us today and for sharing um, your knowledge. No, you're most welcome, most enjoyable. Thank you. Thanks very much, Leon.